Is inflation over? Only a few weeks ago, the financial market was flirting with the idea that the global interest rate hiking cycle was over, or nearly over. Then this week, the Bank of Canada and the Reserve Bank of Australia raised interest rates somewhat unexpectedly and warned that there could be more to come. With inflation in the UK only lower than that of Turkey and Argentina among G20 countries, the Bank of England is expected to raise interest rates to 5% by the end of the summer. The Federal Reserve is poised to hike rates again too, especially given the debt ceiling deal pay only lip service to fiscal discipline. What is prolonging the interest rate hiking cycle among the advanced economies? What lessons can these countries learn from the developing countries like Brazil, Mexico, China, India, or even Russia that seem to have done a better job in terms of responding to the global inflation shocks of the past three years? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. The world economy was hit by two massive inflation shocks over the past three years. The first one was the result of supply chain disruptions brought about by the lockdowns. The second one was a spike in commodity prices unleashed by the Russia sanctions. Both shocks have passed, or at least gone into remission. For example, six months after China lifted its lockdown, global supply chains are back to normal. Backlogs have eased, and supply delivery time has improved substantially. Freight rates for forwarding containers have collapsed. There's even a glut in some highly sought-after products during the lockdown that are now driving down their prices. The Russia-Ukraine war is still going on but commodity prices have fallen back considerably. Oil prices declined sharply over the past six months, as Russia has found ways to get around the sanctions and its oil exports surged. Natural gas price in Europe has collapsed as inventory has built up. These developments beg the burning question. If the main drivers of inflation of the past three years have largely reversed, and given the base effect associated with the war-related price shock should have fallen out of the data by now, why is inflation not much lower? Why is consumer price inflation in the Eurozone still above 6% and in the UK above 8% on a year-on-year -year basis? US inflation has fallen back more, but why is it still near its 30-year high? A year ago, the Federal Reserve was forecasting the so-called PCE inflation to end last year at 2.6%. It was off by three percentage points. Right now, the bond market is predicting that U.S. CPI inflation will be just above 2% in a year's time. Will this prediction prove to be right? Will central banks succeed in bringing inflation back to 2% without pushing the global economy into a recession? To answer this question, I think it's important to realize that different countries have responded differently to the global inflation shocks and have produced very different results. In the Americas, inflation in the US and Canada has gradually declined, and so has been the case in Mexico. However, Brazil currently has the honor of having the lowest consumer price inflation reading among the major economies in the Americas. The rapid pace of this inflation in Brazil over the past year has been impressive. In Europe and the Middle East, the Eurozone and the UK have seen inflation decline gradually over the past few months, although this is happening faster in the Eurozone than in the UK. Russia and Saudi Arabia are tied for having the lowest consumer price inflation at the moment. In the case of Russia, this has been helped in part by the base effect associated with the inflation spike last April, dropping out of the data. But nevertheless, Russian inflation is now at the lowest level since early 2020. As for Saudi Arabia, it's benefited from the fact it is a major oil producer and the citizens enjoy huge subsidies on their gasoline consumption. This means the energy price spike last year had no effect on Saudi inflation. In Asia, inflation trends have been 
even less synchronized. Inflation in China is at zero, while inflation in Australia is currently just below 7%. While inflation in most of the region is declining, this is less obvious in Japan, where inflation is currently at a multi-decade high. The pace of disinflation in India has quickened over the past three months. There's a lot going on here, but currently, Chinese inflation is lower than US inflation. Russian inflation is lower than the Eurozone inflation. And Indian inflation is lower than inflation in Australia. Do I see a pattern here? Directly comparing inflation between countries can be misleading, given different countries may have different trend inflation. In general, developing countries tend to have higher inflation than developed countries, often deliberately so. For example, the Reserve Bank of India has an inflation target of 2 to 6 percent, while the Bank of England has an inflation target of 2 percent. To compare apples with apples, I have normalized inflation for each country by calculating the so-called z-score, using the inflation data of each country over the past 10 years. The z-score tells us how high or how low the current level of inflation is relative to the sample history. A high z-score means it is much higher than the average, while a low z-score means it is much lower than the average. When we compare the z-scores of the current level of inflation across the largest developed and developing countries in the world today, a striking result emerges. Interestingly, countries currently with the lowest z-scores in our country sample all happen to be developing countries. They include China, Brazil, Russia, India, and Saudi Arabia. In contrast, countries with the highest z-scores are all developed countries, led by the Eurozone, Australia, and the UK. Is this somehow because the share of energy and food components differ between these countries? To consider this possibility, I did the same exercise for core inflation, meaning inflation stripped of its energy and food components. Well, the results are not too different. China, India, and Brazil still have the lowest z-scores. And Eurozone, Australia, and the UK, and Japan still have the highest z-scores, even if the order between them has changed a little. And the US, Mexico, Korea, Russia, and Canada are in the middle of the pact with similar z-scores. So what is going on? What is driving this disparity across these countries? There has been a lot of discussion about second round inflation lately. In a speech this week, the Dutch central bank governor, a European central bank governing council member, talked about how energy prices have found their way into other items in the consumer basket, and wages and services in particular have taken over the inflation torch. Because inflation was high for a long period, underlying inflationary pressures have built up as a consequence, we now observe second round effects, he said. Second round effects on inflation usually start with an increase in inflation expectations. Between March 2020 and September 2022, German median household inflation expectations for the 12 months ahead climbed from just 2% to 9%. It has since come down to 6%. However, the concern is that the longer inflation stays high, the more permanent the shock to inflation expectations becomes, and the more difficult it will be to bring inflation back to 2%. By the way, it will be soon two years that German inflation has remained above 4%. In Australia, inflation has been running above 6% for four consecutive quarters now. This could be why inflation expectations suddenly reversed course last month and went back above 5%. This prompted the Reserve Bank of Australia to raise interest rates and removed a reference in its policy statement that medium-term inflation expectations remain well anchored. Increased inflation expectations often lead to increased wage growth, as workers demand higher pay to compensate for loss of purchasing power. In 2022, the minimum wage in France was increased four times and by 8% compared to 2021. In the UK, workers' total pay increased by 5.8% and regular pay by 6.7% in the first quarter of 2023. 
It is telling that wage growth in the UK is accelerating even though the labor market has clearly cooled. As wage growth accelerates, inflation starts to creep up in the service sector, especially the more labor-intensive sectors. U.S. inflation in core services, excluding housing, which the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell calls the most important category for understanding the future evolution of core inflation, currently at 5.1% is above the headline consumer price inflation at 4.9%. Second round effects on inflation is the most dangerous aspect of any inflation shock, as it can feed on itself and become self-sustaining. When second round effects are left unchecked, they can lead to a wage price spiral. The discussion about second round effects bring us back to why so many developing countries seem to be doing better than their developed peers in dealing with the global inflation shocks of the past three years. Is it possible they have been more successful in mitigating the second round effects of the inflation shocks? Beyond dispute is the fact that many developing central banks were ahead of the curve in terms of recognizing the emerging inflation risks and much more proactive in responding to them. In the Americas, Canada started raising interest rates in March 2022, and the Fed began even two months later. However, Brazil has started hiking interest rates already a year earlier, with Mexico not too far behind. In Europe and the Middle East, the Bank of England started raising rates in December 2021, while the European Central Bank waited until July 2022 before it began its tightening cycle. In contrast, Bank of Russia began to hike rates already in April 2021, nearly a year before the war started. Even though there's little inflation in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Monetary Authority has been gradually raising its policy rates in tandem with the Federal Reserve. In Asia, Korea started raising rates in August 2021, nearly nine months before Australia began to move. Not only developing central banks move against the global inflation shocks faster, they also kept real interest rates higher, in other words, monetary policy tighter than developed economies. At the moment, real interest rates among developing countries are considerably higher than those of developed countries. Part of this reflects a difference in risk premium, that is, emerging markets have to offer higher interest rates to attract foreign investors. But part of this also reflects a difference in policy stance. The fact that real interest rates are deep in the negative territory for the UK, Australia, Japan, and the Eurozone suggests that monetary policy in these economies has not tightened that much. We said earlier that the longer second round effects on inflation are allowed to spread, it becomes more difficult and more costly to bring down inflation afterwards. The fact that developing central banks lean against the global inflation shocks more quickly and more aggressively than their developed counterparts is consistent with the fact that their inflation has come down more quickly. Bottom line, the global inflation shocks of the past three years is likely just a harbinger of what's to come. Deglobalization currently underway will have many consequences, and one of them will be higher inflation. The success of any economy in this new regime will depend crucially on its ability to keep inflation under control. The major developing countries have taken inflation risks more seriously and responded more aggressively to them than the developed ones. Time will tell, but this will likely mean that developing countries have more room to cut interest rates and ease fiscal policy when the next recession comes. We definitely cannot say the same about many developed economies especially the likes of the Eurozone, UK, Australia, and Japan. What this means, at least in theory, is that the growth advantage enjoyed by developing countries will become even more evident, or else being equal, with important investment implications, of course. If you got something out of this video, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments in the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, Come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.